We want to talk about something today that uh, if you don't have in abundance, God won't have anything to do with you whatsoever. And the title of our thoughts is called Humble Yourself. Humble Yourself. Our quotation today comes from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, and we quote, he says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, unquote. This act of humbling oneself is one of the hardest things for a human to do. We even find this example as far back as the Garden of Eden, where God addressed Adam after he had disobeyed. We look at Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 9. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he, Adam, said, well, I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he, God, said, who told you that you were naked? In this account, Adam exhibited fear towards God rather than humility. What, what is the meaning of this word? We've all heard it all of our lives. And, and you actually, if you don't look into it, you don't understand or appreciate it. And why is it so hard for us to conform to its meaning? The scriptures are loaded with examples of this character example. But first, the meaning of the word. From the English dictionary, it says, tending to yourself as having no special importance that makes you better than others, not proud. One of the strongest examples in scripture of humble is that of Moses. You would think, how could that be? He was the leader of the entire Jewish nation. All had to answer to him. Nevertheless, we find in the scriptures that he was beloved of God. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Numbers, chapter 12. That's book of Numbers, chapter 12. And we'll read starting with verses 1 throughout. In this account, Moses' brother and his sister Miriam were punished for not believing God, verse 1. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard this. Now the man Moses was very humble, more so than any man on the face of the earth, according to the scriptures. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and Miriam, you three come out of the tent of meeting. So the three of them came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of a cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And when they had both come forward, he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make known to him in a vision. I shall speak to him in a dream. Then he gives the caveat to this. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Here God clearly defines what his interpretation of being humble is. Moses was so self-defeating 
when God first approached him, he told him, he says, I, I can't even speak well. Moses was always looking out for the welfare of others. You know, when we think of a humble person, and this happens quite frequently, we, we think of someone who is weak. This is not the case. Humility is a characteristic of a person who has strong principles with a flawless character. When Paul was writing to the church at Philippi, he reminded them about Timothy. And we read in Philippians that at that time, Paul was going to send Epiroditus. This brother risks limb and life for the cause of Christ, starting with verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send you Epaporitus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you, for you all, and was distressed because he had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly in order that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I be less concerned about you. Therefore, receive him in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. And brethren, we can't emphasize this enough that this trait of humility is crucial in your walk and your relationship with our Heavenly Father. Here was a brother who was not concerned for his own safety, but trudged forward for the sake of the cause of Christ. He put others before himself. He was humble. Lest we forget the Apostle Paul. Now here was a man of high esteem. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees who gave it all up and humbled himself before the Lord that he might serve him all the days of his life. Paul's humility is on display when he considers himself as the least of the apostles in 1 Corinthians 15 and 9. And he goes on and he says that he feels like he is the chief of all sinners, is in 1 Timothy 1 15. In our examples of humility in the entire Bible, there is none greater than our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul writes of Christ in the Philippians that we should do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. And he says, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interest of others. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, we read that Jesus gave up the glory that he had in heaven. He gave up his place on the throne where God rules the universe. He gave up his power to defend himself, not willingly, but gave his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45. He loved us so much, brethren. He loved us so much that he died for us. He endured such shame, ridicule, 
scorn, torture, humility, and an agonizing death on the cross. What greater humility is there? If we think back on the night of the Passover meal, Jesus washed the disciples' feet, even the feet of the one who would betray him. Here, the Son of God taking the form of a servant and washing the dirty, smelly feet of the disciples, even the feet of an enemy. We have no excuse. Christ set the bar for humility. I like to think that God's grace is like water. It always flows downhill and seeks the lowest level. It never reaches the high and lofty places, but only to those who are low, meek, and humble. And better to understand this concept of humility, we must examine its counterpart, that which is the opposite of humility. In the late 70s, there was a song by a popular artist that epitomizes the world's concept of humility. The, ly the lyrics of that song go something like this. And it was a very popular song. People loved it, but didn't realize what it was actually saying. It says, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. The sentiments of this song reflect the attitude for the most part of the world. Here are some of the world's measures of success, to be arrogant, to be haughty, and of course, self-serving, selfish, having or, or showing feelings of unwarranted importance out of an overbearing pride and self-respecting big-headed. Like another popular song stated, I think it was by a very famous artist. He says, I did it my way. Think it can't happen to you? Think again. I myself have fallen into several of these traps of the adversary, but by the grace of God, I escaped. Speaking of the adversary, turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 28. And Ezekiel, in this account, is the overthrow of the, the king of Tyre, who obviously represents Satan. In verse 15, it states, and this is phenomenal. It says, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Now, brethren, here was a being of extraordinary beauty and wisdom of whom incidentally held the same office in heaven as that of the Logos, the morning star. Yet he failed. He failed. Again, we read of a similar account of him through the eyes of, of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 14. Here we witness the greatest of the seven deadly sins that of pride shown by the adversary, starting with verse 12, and we quote, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God and I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights, the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Here we have the famous five I wills. Pride 
cometh before destruction and destruction before the fall. In the book of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 12, we read, it says, and whomever exalts himself, in other words, boy, I am great. Look what I have accomplished. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. And whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. For as the scriptures say, for promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and set up another. It comes from the King James. A classic, a classic example of this is God's dealing with Nebuchadnezzar. Remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar? He was a, quite an engineer and architect and built this tremendous city. Standing on the corner of his building, he looked around and surveyed it and he said, look at all I have accomplished. Look at what I have done. There's that big eye again. Brethren, pride is one of the most destructive characteristics a human can experience. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it is stated that difficult times would come. In this epistle, the apostle states several conditions that fly in the face of humility, just to mention a few. Lovers of self. Now, wait a minute. Stop and think if you see this today. Lovers of self malicious gossips, looking around, do you find any truth anywhere in this world, brethren? Like Jesus said, when I come, will I find truth? Malicious gossips, and always learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Returning to our theme text, the apostle states, humble yourselves, he says. This scripture emphatically reveals who Peter is referring to. It's to those who are running for the prize of the high calling. The world's opportunity for this submitting themselves will come as they enter the millennium period for correction. The prospective bride class is being judged now to prove their faithfulness to the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We are all in this one-room schoolhouse of Christ, albeit at different levels of understanding, but that faithfulness will be judged by God himself. There's a very insightful article in reprint 5186, that's reprint 5186 on humility. It takes you to a different perspective, and we'll quote it. The article says, nothing is more dangerous to the child of God than self-conceit. It hinders reformation of heart as well as true youthfulness, usefulness in God's service. For the word declares, that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble, James 4, 6. The scriptures make prominent the fact that those who would be in harmony with God, as we spoke earlier, they must be in harmony with God, and they must be humble. The Lord bestows blessings upon the humble, the meek, the teachable. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, Matthew 5, 5. Remember those Beatitudes? The apostle exhorts, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now, the word of God points to the fact that Jesus was meek and lowly, as found in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. 
This humility of mind and heart was, in many respects, the secret of his success. If he had not been humble, he would not have attained to the glorious station to which he was exalted. There, there is a marked contrast, brethren, between Jesus and Satan. The one thought to exalt himself and the other to humble himself. Isaiah 14 and 13 and Philippians 2, 8. Satan said, I will elevate myself above the other angels. I will be like the most high and exert such a power as he does. I could show the angels such great wisdom if I were in control of affairs. Inspired by this wrong spirit, Satan became ambitious to make an exhibition of what he could do. The scriptures give us to understand that Satan's inordinate desire to gain distinction was the secret of his fall. Ambition is good, but only when it is based on humility. Any spirit that does not respect God's wisdom is indeed foolish. Satan's ambition was one of ambition and pride. Already highly favored of God is one of the highest rank of angels, possibly right up by the Logos. He wasn't content with his great honors and blessings, but was desirous of obtaining still greater influence and power that God had been pleased to grant him. This, this unlawful aspiration to obtain control led him not only to rebel against the divine government, but also to become the murderer as we read in John 8, 44, of our first parents, that he might gain control over them, the object of his ambition. How short-sighted, how short-sighted was the adversary that he should think to out-general Jehovah and to exalt himself and erect a rival kingdom. Well, you know, soon Satan's folly will be manifested when the Lord's due time shall come. The one who humbled himself in obedience to the Father's will shall be exalted to kingly power and authority, to the position at the Father's right hand in the kingdom of the universe. But the one who attempted the usurpation shall be bound and utterly destroyed, unquote. Everything, brethren, is done according to the Father's will. Everything that happens in life, whether it's with us or the world or the material world or whatever, is done according to the Father's will and timetable. We have this confirmed to us in the book of Mark, chapter 13, verse 32. And these are the words of Jesus. He says, but of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Jesus was speaking to them at that time about his return, the, the second time, and when the judgment on the earth would occur, and to put it in common terms, when he was going to pull the plug on this world and stop this evil. You know, it's one thing to memorize scriptures, but it's quite another to not only know them, but to live them. The words in the Bible are not just mere words printed on a page, but they are life which proceed out of the mouth of God. In our theme text, the scripture, the apostle was giving us sound advice on the proper conduct and attitudes towards our heavenly father. In verse one of this chapter five, he is shepherding the leaders to conduct themselves in a spiritual manner 
He says, therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God. And not for sordid gain not for payment, but with eagerness, nor as yet lording over those allotted to your charge. Never do that, but proving to be exemplars to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Then he goes into the aspect of humility, which is our focus today. He says, only the submissive. Let me emphasize this again. He says, only the submissive will pass the inspection. We have to follow in the same path as our Lord. When our Lord was crucified, he was placed between two thieves. To him, it would mean the depths of humiliation. Every noble and pure heart would absolutely be mortified to be placed in such a position as he was. How he must have loathed sin. How utterly opposed to it in every sense of the word. And how much more shame he must have felt than we could possibly have felt in his position. From the Heavenly Father's standpoint, his permission that his son be numbered with the transgressors was evidently to be a demonstration to the angels and men of the son's loyalty of heart to the most extreme. As we read, he humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. And so it is. We, if faithful, will be put to the test to see if we are acceptable to the Father for a place in glory. In all of this, Jesus became an illustration to his followers. As the apostles suggest, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, no matter how deep the humiliation which obedience to God may bring that he may exalt you in due time. And brethren, we don't know when our time is up. God has each one numbered exactly when he will take them, but we don't know. So every moment of our life should be in close communication with God to understand him and to do his will the best that we can. You know, you may experience false accusations or outright lies of which you had no part in order that you might be tested. But remember, the Father is over all and will not allow the trial to be more than you can handle. Ironic as it may seem, our Lord humbled himself, and God highly exalted him to the very position which Satan coveted. Satan became proud and vain in his imagination, thus losing his exalted position. Returning to the theme text found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6. We'd be quite a mess if we didn't finish the thought which the Apostle Peter intended for us to learn. And we'll quote it all the way through. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all of your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. 
but resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself, God himself, protect, perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. As is our custom, we would like to close our thoughts with a little poem that seals our purpose. It goes like this, very short. A little talk with Jesus. How it smooths the rugged road. How it seems to help me onward when I faint beneath my load. When my heart is crushed with sorrow and mine eyes or tears are dim, there is naught that can yield me comfort like a little talk with him.